Today, I want to talk about this, the 13 inch M4 MacBook Air, which I got specifically for photo editing using Lightroom Classic whilst away from home. And in the three months or so that I've owned it, I've put through it well over 33,000 images, courtesy largely to a week long local dance festival I shoot around Easter time each year. Now, although I use the laptop to whittle the images down and also to apply an initial edit, I ultimately synchronise things back to my main desktop system in order to finalise orders, etc. However, given that my main desktop machine is still an old Intel iMac from 2020, I did contemplate when getting the Air whether I shouldn't just spend a little bit more money and get a higher spec MacBook Pro and revert back to using a single device for both my desktop and travel solution as I used to. Now obviously I didn't go down that route and so in this video I'm going to talk briefly why that was, what I think of the Air, how I've been using it and how it's been performing. But as this is my first M chipped Mac, I was also interested to see just how much improvement in performance there'd be between it and my old iMac, which might just help others who have also yet to make the move to Apple Silicon. However, I'm not going to be using benchmark tools. Instead, I'm going to demonstrate some actual tasks utilizing Lightroom Classic, as well as some integration with Topaz Photo AI and DxO Photo Lab. So if any of that interests you, then please stick around. Now then, good to be with you all again. So I bought this M4 MacBook Air shortly after its launch in March of this year. And no doubt by now, you'll be all too well aware of what it has to offer, its specs and price, etc. having probably consumed plenty of content on it already. And you're all probably fed up with everyone harping on about the sky blue color. Therefore, this isn't going to be a full blown review. Instead, I'm going to be talking about my real world experiences of this laptop, concentrating on its use for photo editing, specifically with Lightroom Classic. Now, whilst the base spec model now comes with 16 gigabytes of RAM as standard, which has obviously drawn much praise from reviewers, I decided to go with a slightly higher spec, 24 gigabytes of memory, mainly because I just wanted a little bit more headroom. And I also decided to go with the 512 gigabyte storage option, again, just to give me that little bit of extra headroom and also flexibility. Yes, you can use external storage and hook up an external drive, sticking it to the reverse of a screen if necessary to keep things tidy. But there are times when I just don't want to have anything attached to the laptop. It certainly makes the laptop easier to manage, especially if you want to use it in a confined space or even on your knee. Now, by adding either the RAM or storage upgrade options, you're also getting a bit of a bonus in that you get two extra GPU cores. But with the storage and RAM upgrades I went with, the price of the 13 inch Air comes in at £13.99 or dollars, which is only 200 less than the base spec 14 inch MacBook Pro, which also has 512 gigabytes of storage, but only 16 gigabytes of memory. However, there are times when a 16 gig MacBook Pro will outperform a 24 gig MacBook Air, notably when under sustained load due to the absence of any fans in the air. The Pro also has a better screen, better sound, and better connectivity, all of which makes the MacBook Pro a very compelling option, and for some, probably the better option to go with, especially if you engage in intensive processes and it's going to be your only device. However, for me, one of the primary requirements was portability, especially for travel, which is also why I didn't go with the 15 inch MacBook Air, which naturally would be the more preferable device for photo editing, given the larger screen size. And whilst both the 14 inch Pro and 15 inch Air would easily fit into my main travel backpack, a Wonder Provoke Lite, which I also did a video on recently, with the 13 inch Air, I can fit it into that bag whilst in a protective sleeve, if I so wish to do so. And it will also fit easily into my Peak Design 10 litre everyday sling and my Billingham Hadley Pro shoulder bag. And of course, the 13 inch Air is lighter than either of the 15 inch Air or 14 inch Pro which therefore gives me a lot of versatility and options as to how I might want to use and transport the laptop. So what's it like to use? Well, quite frankly, great. 
Lightroom Classic has been very responsive. There's no signs of lag when using sliders and applying local adjustments. And the same is true for DxO Photo Lab 8. However, the 13 inch Air isn't without some issues. Notably, the screen at 13 inches can feel a bit cramped for prolonged detail photo editing. Obviously, this can be alleviated by hooking it up to an external monitor if using it as a desktop device. And for travel, in order to get more desktop real estate, well, you can always mirror the screen to a compatible iPad if you have one to hand. And this works really well for photos. And before anyone mentions it, I'd also have an iPad with me in any case, even if I'd gone with the 15 inch. Alternatively, or even additionally, whilst in the develop module of Lightroom, closing the left panel can also ease things a little bit, giving you a larger view of the image you're working on. Although I have to admit, if you are wanting to create intricate selections in, say, Photoshop, it might prove a little challenging on a small screen. Another slight issue, for some, might be the low screen brightness. At 500 nits, it can be difficult to see details if you're in a bright environment. However, in reality for photo editing, it's best not to be in a bright environment. And so, under normal lighting conditions, 500 nits proves more than adequate. Now, as I mentioned earlier, following the festival, I ultimately synchronized things across to my main desktop where I did more refined edits once orders came in. And it was at this point where I started to try out some of my same workflow on the laptop as well as on the desktop using Topaz and DxO Photolab. And I was absolutely stunned by the performance I was getting out of this little thing, bearing in mind that it costs half the price my iMac did when I bought it about five years ago. And so I thought I'd do a few more comparison tests using Lightroom. First, we'll look at sending images out from Lightroom to Topaz Photo AI and DxO Photo Lab 8. I first measured the time it took for five images to open up in the relevant app from the time they were sent. And I then timed how long it took for them to be re-exported back into Lightroom with an appropriate process applied. With Topaz, it was with face recovery and denoise applied using the default settings. And with DxO, it was with Deep Prime 3 and optical corrections applied. In all cases, Topaz and DxO were in a close state before running the tests. Now looking first at sending images to Topaz from Lightroom, you can use one of two methods. First is the edit in option, which uses either TIFFs or JPEGs. I elected to use JPEGs, and these times are shown in the top graph. Or we can send them from the plugin extras menu option as DNGs, which is shown in the bottom graph. Light blue represents the MacBook Air, whilst green represents the iMac. And as you can see, in the first set of results in the top graph, the Air was slightly quicker than the iMac in how long it took to get the images into Topaz using the edit in option. And from the first set of results in the bottom graph, sending images to Topaz using the plugin extras menu method, it's a fraction slower than the iMac. But it was the time taken for the images to get back into Lightroom which showed the biggest differences, as shown in the second set of results in each chart. And as can be seen, these were heavily in favour of the Air, which was nearly three minutes faster on each occasion. But interestingly, whilst the Air was about 70% faster than the iMac in bringing back the JPEGs into Lightroom using the Edit In option, it was only about 50% faster when bringing back the DNGs using the plugin Extras menu option, which was a longer process overall. And this is a trend that tends to continue throughout these tests. The longer the process takes, the less advantage the Air has over my iMac. Now with DxO, we only have the one option as to how to send the images from Lightroom, and that is via the plugin extras menu feature. But we can bring the images back as either DNGs, TIFFs, or JPEGs. I chose to get DNGs. So using the same five images as before, we can see that the process using DxO is way faster than Topaz for both devices, and that the Air is way faster interacting with DxO than the Mac is. The top set of results is the time taken for the images to open in DxO, having been sent from Lightroom, and the bottom set of results is the time taken for the images to be exported out from DxO back to Lightroom. Now, of course, Lightroom has its own enhanced features, including denoise, as well as enhanced raw details and super resolution, all of which 
return a DNG file. Well, it did up until the release of the latest 14.4 version. More on that later. And again, using the same five images as before, I did tests for each of these processes. And looking at these times, we find a bit of a mixed bag, as can be seen in the three set of results here. The top set are the times for applying denoise at 50%, for which the air was actually slower than the iMac, taking a minute longer. However, for both the second set results applying enhanced raw details and the third enhanced super resolution, the overall processes which were quicker than applying denoise, the air was slightly quicker than the iMac. So again, we see the impact of the air's performance as things take longer to complete. But one significant issue I had was that with the iMac, I consistently had at least one image corrupted during these processes. So it's no good being the fastest, as in the denoise test, if all you get back is a corrupted image. Now, literally just before I started recording this video, Adobe released Lightroom 14.4, which changes how the enhanced features work. Instead of producing a separate DNG file, the process now takes place non-destructively within the develop module on the standard RAW file. And to apply the changes across multiple images, you simply employ the sync settings as you would normally have in first apply the changes to an initial image. And so doing a quick test with the new method, just syncing the five images using the enhanced denoise again at 50%, I found that it's not only again quicker on the iMac, but that the iMac was slightly quicker than before, whilst the air is slightly slower on the new method. But of course, you have to add the time for applying the settings to the initial image. For the raw details enhanced feature using the new method, both devices are a bit quicker than before, with the air being the quickest as it was with the old method. And the same is true for super resolution using the new method, with the air being quicker as it was before, with the iMac taking a minute longer than the air. Now something I frequently do in Lightroom is to stitch panoramas, as well as sending a set of images to open as layers in Photoshop to facilitate focus stacking and image blending. For the pano, I tested both devices stitching 11 raw images, measuring first how long it took to get to the preview screen from selecting photo merge as panorama option in Lightroom Classic, and then measured the time to complete the stitch and to get the DNG image back into Lightroom, having selected auto settings and auto crop. And there's not a lot to choose between the two devices. And even editing this huge 246 megapixel image once back in Lightroom, applying local edits, etc., doesn't really cause the air to break into a sweat. Next, I measured how long it took to open 11 images as layers in Photoshop. And for these, I just used the same 11 images as for the panorama test, just because they were to hand. Now, I wouldn't normally open 11 images as layers, but yeah, you never know. Now, I didn't actually do anything with the layers. I just timed how long it took for the final image in the layer set to be presented. And again, there was only a few seconds separating the two devices, although the air is the quicker of the two. So the air can certainly perform just fine for these sorts of processes, and even has a slight advantage over my older device. One thing I did notice though, whilst doing the pano export test, was that Lightroom's RAM usage on the air peaked at around 20 gigabytes. So if you do a lot of similar panos, the base spec air with just 16 gigabytes of memory might struggle a little bit more. Now, so far, the air has taken most of the plaudits, but moving on to the last two sets, building previews and exporting, things start to change. For the previews, I first built a thousand standard previews at the same size of 2,880 pixels for each device as shown in the first set of results. I then built a thousand one-to-one -one previews as shown in the second set. And as you can see, the iMac, again shown in green, now starts to show a significant performance advantage over the air. And it's a similar story for the conversion of the 1000 RAW files to DNGs. Whilst the air starts off well, it slows down after a while and finishes about two minutes after the iMac. And finally, with the export tests, I exported full-size JPEGs from my Canon R5 RAW files at 240 ppi. I tested the time to export 100, 200, 250, 500, and 1000 images. 
Initially, I only did the 100 and 1000 test, but due to the massive reversal in fortune between these two sets of results, I started working backwards, reducing the quantity each time, and I wanted to see where the air started to lose it. And as you can see, it was for the 200 export tests where things steadily got worse. And around this point, we see temperatures have risen to just over 100 centigrade, which then drop down as thermal throttling reduces power from a peak of around the mid 30 watts. Power then continues to fluctuate between about 10 and 20 watts for the remainder of the process. Therefore, again, we see that as the processes take longer to complete, the air starts to lose out. So what's my takeaway from all of this and what my final thoughts on the MacBook Air? Is it any good for photo editing, especially when using Lightroom Classic? Well, from a performance point of view and not too unsurprisingly as we've seen, the more demanding and the longer a process takes, the less capable the air becomes as it starts to generate more heat and becomes subjected to thermal throttling due to the lack of a fan. And this seems to occur at around the two minute point. Well, when doing the 1000 image export test at least, this threshold will obviously be dependent upon the task in hand. And whilst my iMac might seem to do better for these longer processes, if you were to put it up against any other M4 device with a fan, say even a base M4 Mac Mini, it would most probably lose. If you check out the Art is Rights channel, who's done numerous tests on Macs, in his test of the 16 gigabyte M4 Mac mini with 512 gigs of storage, it exported 1000 JPEGs at 240 PPI from his 60 megapixel Sony A7R5 RAW files in just 14 minutes, 52 seconds. Remember, my Air took just over 45 minutes whilst my iMac took 31 minutes to export the same quantity from my Canon's 45 megapixel R5 RAW files. And so a lower spec fan equipped M4 Mac Mini is going to be far more productive than the Air or even my iMac for more intensive actions, including bulk exports, etc. Therefore, if you're a photographer who regularly deals with large quantities of images at a time, especially whilst exporting or doing large panoramas, then the Air is probably not going to be for you, especially if it's going to be your only machine. But of course, the majority of Lightroom editing isn't necessarily that intensive, and not everyone's exported even a couple of a hundred, let alone a thousand images at a time. And most of the time, I'm probably only dealing with a few images at a time as well. And so in these situations, the MacBook Air is more than capable, and therefore is a great little photo editing machine for using with Lightroom Classic, which is just what I wanted. Something that's easy to transport, but has a good enough punch when needed. And in all honesty, I think as a secondary portable device, having now used the Air, I could probably have easily got away with just the 16 gigabyte memory option and saved myself a couple of hundred quid. Although I have to say, I'm still happy with the extra storage option that I went with. And whilst I would have certainly pushed to get a higher spec MacBook Pro if it was to be my only computer, I much prefer to use a dedicated desktop machine as my main device and use a laptop for portability. So if you're a photographer who doesn't necessarily deal with hundreds of images at a time, or you're wanting a small lightweight photo editing machine, especially for travel, then the 13 inch M4 MacBook Air is certainly worth considering. And if you're still an Intel Mac user, deliberating whether to move over to Apple Silicon, then I think it's plain to see that even the lower spec devices can easily do the job for many photographers. Well, I hope that's been of use to some of you. Until next time, thank you ever so much for watching. Take care, TTFN, ta-ta for now.